black as water. And he's sinking like that. And if you look, all his limbs are all tied up with uh, metallic braces. I mean, he, and he's got this bubble around his head like he can't breathe or something. I mean, there's birds over his, you see the birds? <laughs> I, don't know what, I don't know what that symbolizes. But it's just, a, I, I, it's just disturbing to me to even look at it. He gave it to me hoping I would put it on my office wall. <laughs> I was like, no. I took it, but of course I'm hiding it behind my desk because I don't want anybody to see. So, so it's very disturbing. This is, a, this is what you see, could see, from people in that uh, Solanacea family. When they're that disturbed, the mind does weird things like that, and the artwork speaks it. So I like that family of remedies. You've got to learn them if you want to treat uh, psychiatric problems. So dsm 4 you know, we've got the four, three classes of dsm 4 conditions, psychiatric conditions, mood disorders, thought disorders, personality disorders. And, of course, we have the mundane stuff that don't have an ICD-9 code attached to, them, attached to them. From what I have learned and heard and seen, I would say you can treat just about all of those with homeopathy. And I don't have experience with every single one of those. Like, I haven't seen every single personality disorder. But I would say from what I understand, you can, homeopathy can tackle all those. And so I'm in the learning process myself. Um, but it's, it's good to know that homeopathy can tackle all those problems. I usually see, mood, I see a lot of mood disorders, like depression, anxiety. Thought disorders like paranoia, OCD, schizophrenia, I see far less, but I do see them. And personality disorders, I can't say I have a whole lot of experience with personality disorders. I've seen some, but I, don't, I can't say, I can't make a general statement about that. Um, but from what I understand, you can actually help them homeopathically. So. Um, Okay, there are different methods of uh, practicing homeopathy. There's a classical homeopathy, which is my background, but there's also clinical homeopathy. Now, classical homeopathy, home, homeopath, don't look, don't, they don't like to even talk about clinical homeopathy, but they do do it. They do it. That's when you, you know somebody's bruised and you give them arnica. That's clinical homeopathy, right? A lot of naturopaths do clinical homeopathy. It's good to understand clinical homeopathy, even if you don't want to do it. It's, it's useful. So somebody has a bruise. I mean, you know, what are the chances of you harming them if you give them arnica 30C? Do it, just do it. If you don't know anything about homeopathy, just arnica 30 C. You're not going to kill them. But if you, are, if you get well-versed in clinical homeopathy, you can actually do a lot of good. So today we're going to talk about the remedies that I'm suggesting, recommending for these different mental disorders. Uh, I have uh, recommended remedies. Some of them uh, basically uh, are basically from that perspective of clinical homeopathy. So clinically speaking, let's say aconite is good for panic disorders. It's good. It's not going to, I mean, you could be sepia and need, uh, have panic attacks and need sepia, but it's good to have that tucked in in the back of your mind that aconite could be a possibility. So I have a lot of recommendations like that in my notes. Okay, proper assessment, again, is very important. I get a little girl coming into my office, five, year old, five years old. She uh, looks like she's pulsatilla, perfect pulsatilla. Sweet. And just, she wanted to sit on my lap as soon as she came in. That's such a pulsatilla case. And then it turns out she cries twice a week every time she thinks about her grandmother who died when she was two. Now she's five. So for three years, two, three times a week, she cries, weeps for her dead grandmother. Now that's not right, right? That's just not right. It's not normal. So, and I, I diagnose her with PTSD. Now think about it. That's, that, to me, that kind of an emotional trauma, you could say that's PTSD. And we don't want to get into the why, the details of it, but I diagnose with PTSD. All I did is I gave her uh, a dose of Ignatia, because Ignatia, from a, a clinical homeopathic perspective, is a remedy that comes up for PTSD. And um, I just gave her Ignatia, even though I was dying to give her the similoma, which is pulsatilla. But I've seen this enough times now. When a person is in PTSD state, their similoma, I'm not very impressed. So I just, I know these PTSD remedies. One of them is Ignatia. And I was like, here, took Ignatia. The weeping cry, everything is stopped. She feels so much happier. It's been several months now. She's doing fantastic. And she's now on Pulsatilla, which is her similimum. That's the core remedy, which is what I saw when she walked in. But when I learned that she weeps three times a week, it's like that's deep. I mean, like sobbing for the grandma. That's not Pulsatilla. It's like she's like scarred due to the grief, right? So just know that there is a place for clinical homeopathy. <clears throat> Excuse me. I need to have a good cough. Okay, so um, again, treatment is based on symptoms rather than diagnosis. We don't treat diagnosis again. I just want to make sure I hammer that in. We don't treat diagnosis. Uh, and no, re, no, remember the addendum, that's a useful thing. Um, conditions that we're going to cover today, very quickly, I'm going to fly through them. Addictions, ADD, ADHD, anxiety, autism, dementia, depression, including bipolar and mania, multiple personality disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, panic attacks, paranoia, delusions, and psychosis. 
right? So it's a lot. Each one of those really could, we could talk for a few hours on each one. So that's why I'm talking so fast. So we have, we can all have a plethora of emotions and thoughts. So everyone can be angry, moody, pissed off, mad, happy, joyous, everything. So just because a person is angry and competitive uh, and has digestive problems doesn't make them Knox or Lycopodium. You know, just, you, get, you gotta realize this, that you could all have all the above. So, um, and the repertoire is not perfect, even though you may be, I wrote down at the bottom. So if you look under, let's say grief, you might say 30 remedies or whatever. Your patient might need a remedy that's not listed in the repertory. So the repertory is not perfect. Um, okay, first condition, addictions, which uh, usually comes along with psychosis. A lot of people who are addicted to street drugs, they have psychotic, uh, they can suffer from psychosis. Um, and I like Dana Ullman's quote there. Uh, quote, he talks about how homeopathic remedies don't change people's habits, but they change people so that then they ch can change their own habits. So there is no remedy for addictions per se, but you can treat the individual who suffers from addictions and hopefully they change their habits. And I've seen wonderful things with homeopathy when it comes to addictions. Um, again, here you want to you prescribe on what's presented to you at the time of your visit with the patient. What's present in the patient at the time? Um, not the core similimum, like what the person was meant to be. You know, it's not, that, that comes later. And one thing that's well, worth mentioning with addictions is that as you treat a person who's addicted, uh, their constitutional remedy changes. You could start with, say, uh, opium, and then four months later, they might need something else. It, it, could, need, it could go to stromonium, and then metarinum, and sulfur. It could go, the remedies change with addictions, because there's such a mess up here. They, they're gonna, they, one remedy is not going to cut it. So there are, this is the onion layer thing that they talk about. Um, these are some remedies to think about. Again, I'm just suggesting, these are suggestions. The remedy that the patient needs with any of these conditions could, may very well not be listed in what I have in the presentation. These are just remedies you want to have, again, tucked away. Like psychosis and addictions, again, you want to think about the Solanacea family. Opium and cannabis, homeopathic opium and cannabis are awesome remedies to be familiar with among those other remedies that I've suggested. Again, these suggestions come from my, personal, my own personal experience and six months of, honestly, day and night research. The last six months, uh, I haven't even spent enough time with my kids uh, preparing for this talk. It is, I've read 15 books uh, front to back, and all the sources are listed at the end of the presentation, all on homeopathy and psychiatry. Um, and the summary of all, the, all of it is here. So it's not, this, aren't, this isn't just stuff I know. It's also from experience of very well-known homeopaths throughout the world, uh, well-respected. So this is just, you can just look at that. Um, I know classical homeopaths are not gonna like this part. Those of you who are classical homeopaths in the room, they're like, wow, oh, you're really oversimplifying homeopathy. But just think about it. If we don't do this, our fellow naturopaths, uh, just not, they're just gonna run away from homeopathy. So I'm trying to make it easier for you guys. Um, so the homeopath out there, you might be ashamed of what I'm doing, but hopefully you'll be, you just relax and go along with the flow. So um, there are two common remedies that I recommend for addictions, and I honestly have had great success with them. Again, the person's keynotes have to match the keynotes of the remedy. And if they do, think of those remedies. Cannabis and homeopathic opium, they're great. I've seen a lot of heroin addicts and uh, people that smoke marijuana all the time. And those remedies are invaluable to help these people. So a heroin, uh, had a patient who was a heroin addict and I gave her homeopathic opium. She literally stopped using the drug and wanted to go to college. Like one dose, opium 200 C, one dose. And she's a prostitute on the streets. The police brought her. I have this whole, there's this project, this, this Genesis project thing in Seattle. They uh, help ladies get off the streets, prostitutes. And they, uh, they, the people that run that institution, they're my patients. So they have seen what homeopathy can do. So they bring these prostitutes to my office once a month. I get a prostitute in my office. It's an honor to serve the community like that. And uh, I had this heroin addict with all kinds of needle marks on her arms and legs. I mean, she was just cut up, all head to toes. Um, you could definitely tell she was a prostitute, with just the way she dressed. Um, and I thought, I think she's sepia. But then I'm like, no, sepia doesn't, it's, it's just not a sepia material. Maybe her core remedy, some will be is sepia, and she might use a sepia a year from now. But at the time when I saw her, she was an opium case. Uh, all the keynotes of opium. You're gonna run into this, I think, non-compliance with these people with addictions, obviously is a problem. If you ask them not to drink coffee, that's just, so there's a big problem with that. It's a big, big problem. They're, they, they're not going to remember or care to do it. So sadly, our hands are tied sometimes. Okay, marijuana. So many kids, I've seen a lot of teenagers and people in their 20s that are smoking marijuana, have smoked marijuana for a long time. They've gotten into this marijuana kit. They've proven marijuana. They have all the keynotes of marijuana in the Materia Medica. So I give them the remedy, 
cannabis, the focus comes back. They love it. They absolutely love it. And the similimum doesn't, doesn't help. Like I talk about a lachesis case here. I could tell she was lachesis, but then she was really checked out. Really dreamy in the clouds. I'm like, that's not how lachesis is. They're usually much more focused. Uh, so give her cannabis, and several months later, I, uh, I believe uh, it took several months to come out of that state, and then she does well with lachesis now. OK, so um, this is just the idea of using methadone for heroin addicts first to get them off of heroin onto methadone, which is a you know, medication, and the psychiatrist can adjust the dose. So you can go to, from heroin addiction to methadone addiction, and hopefully from methadone addiction to homeopathy. And you know what I mean? Like, and all along, you can use homeopathy, of course. But uh, I think it's a smart idea to get these people who are on heroin onto something that a, a, a doctor can uh, monitor. You know, you put them on methadone. Uh, I don't know much about this, but I, I read about this in a book, and I'm like, that makes perfect sense. Okay, uh, I talk about, I've, I've, I looked really hard to find research that proved that homeopathy works for all these problems. And I, I did, as you can imagine, had a hard time finding research for every single condition. I did find some really good research, believe it or not. So I've listed some of them here. I'm not going to read them. You just, this is just resource for you. But there is a lot of research. For those of you who don't believe homeopathy works, we have a lot of research that proves it does. Uh, so there's addictions for you. ADD, ADHD, Dr. Amy talked about that, uh, did a phenomenal job talking about ADD, ADHD the other day. And this is just some uh, research, um, some ideas uh, that you can use. Homeopathy definitely can help ADD, ADHD. I've had great success with that. Uh, here's some good double-blind controlled studies on, research, on ADD, ADHD. A lot of these research, the research on homeopathy comes from Europe, not, which is not surprising. Um, possible remedies that People that are more well known in the community have recommended, so I've just kind of listed them. Like Dale and Dana Ullman, Dr. Nash, I'm a big fan of Dr. Nash. Um, and, I, and of course, I've given all kinds of remedies for ADD, so I didn't even have any, I didn't want to list them all. But, you know, shared the, some of the resources for you. Anxiety, this ne next condition. There are 300 remedies in the repertory under mine anxiety rep uh, rubric. So clearly, um, good luck. <laughs> that's a hard one. It's really difficult to know which one, but then that's where your training comes in. You got to get some training if you really want to tackle this. Um, but here's just again some tips for you. Um, uh, it's noteworthy at the bottom there. There are also many of the physical sections in the repertory under which we can find anxiety. Um, common possible remedies for anxiety are listed there. I really, I've seen so many phosphoruses with anxiety, it's not even funny. It's just like, if I see a person that looks and acts like phosphorus, have the keynotes of phosphorus, uh, and they say I have anxiety, I'm like, well, sure. I mean, that's like, that's a lot, 80% of them have anxiety. So uh, it's a very common one. Posotilus, it's a very common remedy to suffer from anxiety. Carcinosin, and of course, ar arsenicum. Those are the ones that I think of when I think anxiety. Um, again, the constitution has to match, right, the keynotes of the remedy. You don't just say posotilla, you know, phosphorus. Um, Two, okay, uh, research on anxiety, got a lot of research. Um, autism, clinical features, and noteworthy here, uh, subject is the ritualism you see in autism versus OCD, they get confused. OCD comes with it, ritual, ritualistic behavior. Autistic children, of course, they, you, have, you probably, I'm sure you've noticed, they have ritualistic behavior. So what's the difference? And that's the difference to the best of what I could tell. Uh, with autism, the, the person who has autism doesn't suffer from anxiety from what I can, we can tell, whereas with OCD they do. And the age of onset for the ritualism in autism is much younger, like little kids, whereas with uh, OCD is older, like older kids, uh, adolescents. Uh, based on some resource I found, that's the difference. Um, you know, I, I, when I first started practicing, I was like, autism, mental retard retardation, what's the difference? The difference is what is actually pretty uh, obvious is me people who are mentally retarded, they don't act as weird as autistic uh, uh, individuals. There's this autistic kids, people, children and adults, they just act so abnormal. So it's not that they're mentally retarded, also the behavior is so abnormal. So I just thought that was well worth mentioning. Uh, we see great success with autism uh, in homeopathy. I have to say with mental retardation, 